The Bernoulli equation helps us solve for pressure, velocity, density, or head at different locations along a streamline of a fluid field. Picture an object that is moving through a fluid, or what is an equivalent scenario, an object over which a fluid is flowing. These lines are what we call streamlines, and they are the lines that are tangent to the velocity vectors for any given location. Of course, the case we'll be analyzing here is for a steady flow field, meaning that the flow is not changing over time. These lines are usually not really seen by the naked eye in the real world, but sometimes you do see them. Think of a racing car going really fast on a straight and some quote-unquote visible wind over the rear wing. Schematics of objects inside a wind tunnel usually show them, and even real videos or pictures can capture them too. We will define the unit vectors as S for the direction tangential to the streamline at any point, and N for the direction normal to the streamline at any point. The acceleration in the tangential direction would therefore be A sub S, and the acceleration in the normal direction would be A sub N. A sub S would be the change in velocity over time, like it's usually defined for any acceleration, which in this case would be dv dt. With the chain rule, we can also write this as dv ds times ds dt, which is dv ds times the velocity v, since the definition of v would be ds dt. The normal acceleration would be the centripetal acceleration, just like any object on a curved trajectory, like you studied in your physics course or the dynamics course, links below. In other words, it would be a v squared over the radius of curvature r. But we'll leave this normal acceleration for later. Let's look at an infinitesimal element of fluid moving along the streamline. Its dimensions would be dn and ds, correspondingly with n and s, and we'd see its weight force going down. If we define that the pressure at the center of this element is p, then the pressure from the left would be p minus delta p, with delta p being the small change in pressure when moving from the center to the left side of the element. This delta p would be dp ds times the distance from the center to the left side, ds over 2. Therefore, the force vector on that left side would be that pressure times the area dn dy. In this case, we're assuming that that third dimension coming in or out of the screen is the y-axis. In the same way, the pressure on the right side would be p plus delta p, and the force that pressure times the area dn dy. Now, we're gonna make a big assumption here. We will neglect viscous effects. Notice that if we were taking into account viscosity, there would be an uneven sum of forces in the s direction, due to the forces that affect the top and bottom surfaces. When we don't take into account viscosity, we call this an inviscid fluid. With this free body diagram of the infinitesimal fluid element, we can write the sum of forces in the s direction. This should be equal to dm times as, and by substituting the as from before and the mass as density times dv, we have the sum of forces equal to rho dv times v dv ds. For the sum of forces themselves, we'd have the one caused by pressure going to the right affecting the left face, the one on the right going to the left, and the component of the weight rho g dv sine of theta. We rearrange the first two terms to see that they are minus dp ds times a d volume, and therefore the d volume term can be factored out from the left hand side and also from the right hand side. On the left hand side, we see that v times dv ds is the same as one half of the derivative of v squared with respect to ds, chain rule. On the right hand side, we can write sine of theta as dz over ds. That's the definition of sine, opposite dz over hypotenuse ds. With all of this, and canceling all the ds's in the denominators, we can write the expression that we were looking for. If we integrate here, we see that p plus one half of rho v squared plus rho gz must be a constant, the integral of zero. If it is a constant, then it means that when adding these three terms for any fluid element along the streamline, we would get the same value, regardless of its location. Of course, like I just said, along the same streamline. This is what we know as the Bernoulli equation. We can say, for example, that these three terms at location 1 add up to what the same three terms add up to at location 2. Remember that we assume that the fluid is incompressible, since we were using a constant value for rho, 
and in viscid fluid, since we didn't take into account the shear forces due to the viscosity of the fluid, and like it was stated at the beginning with the definition of what a streamline is, that the flow is in steady state. This Bernoulli equation is usually written in three possible ways. The first one is just like it's being shown right now. P is the static pressure, rho V squared over 2 is the dynamic pressure, and rho GZ is the hydrostatic pressure. We also refer to the first two terms together as the stagnation pressure. The word stagnation means not flowing or not moving. For a streamline that doesn't rise or dip, therefore neglecting any changes in height, if we have two points along the streamline, we can state that the velocity at the stagnation point is zero, and therefore the pressure at point two would be equal to the two terms on the left that we had just labeled stagnation pressure. We'll talk more about stagnation pressure and its importance later. Link below if you're interested in skipping ahead. We call this first version of the equation the pressure form of the Bernoulli equation. Notice that every term has units of pressure, for example, density in kilograms per meter cubed and velocity in meters per second squared would yield newtons over meters squared or pascals. Notice that this equation is very similar to what you learned in physics when learning about energy. In that case, we had work, one half of mv squared and mgh, of course, usually together with spring energy back then. If we divide the entire equation by rho and g, we would have the pressure head for the first term, velocity head for the second term, and the elevation head for the third term. We call this the head form of the Bernoulli equation. The head would have units of length, most commonly meters for metric and feet for English units. The third form of Bernoulli would be by dividing by rho only, but this form is not used very often. Now, you can carry out very similar steps in the normal or n direction with the centripetal acceleration stated earlier to get an equation that when integrated looks like this. Of course, to use this expression, you would need to be able to calculate the radius of curvature at any given point along the streamline. But again, more on that later. Now, to really understand the applicability of Bernoulli's equation, it's really important to study the many different scenarios where streamlines occur. So I strongly suggest checking out the two-minute example videos on this topic, including pitot tubes, linked in the description of this video. And just to illustrate how the Bernoulli equation can be used in a very simple case, let's look at the following problem. We have a pressurized reservoir with car fuel that has a density of 780 kilograms per cubic meter. The air pressure inside the tank is 70 kilopascals and the height of the liquid is 5 meters. Right at the bottom of the tank, there's an opening that allows the fuel to be dispensed. What is the exit velocity of the fuel through the opening at the bottom of the tank? Since all of the liquid in the tank would have to come out of it through this hole, we could think of the streamlines as the lines that begin at the fluid surface and end at the exit of the tank. So we are meeting the first requirement, to be on the same streamline between points 1 and 2. The fuel is incompressible and has a low viscosity that would allow us to assume the fluid is inviscid, meeting the other two requirements. Finally, we can assume that the tank is big enough that for the short amount of time we are analyzing, to find the exit velocity of the fluid, the 5 meter height is barely changing. This is an important assumption for two reasons. The first, to meet the fourth requirement, that the flow is at steady state, and the second, to know that the fluid's velocity at 1 is negligible. From what we learned today, if all these assumptions are met, the three terms of pressure from the Bernoulli equation added together would be the same at point 1 and at point 2, along the same streamline. We would have 70 kilopascals for P1, and remember that that's gauge pressure, check the link to the two lectures ago if you haven't watched that yet, 0 for V1, and 5 meters for Z1. At the exit of the tank at point 2, we would have the atmospheric pressure, which has a value of 0 in terms of gauge pressure, the velocity of the fluid at the exit, which is what we're trying to find, and if we used 5 meters for Z1, it means our datum is at point 2, and therefore Z2 is 0. We solve for V2, and by substituting the values for G and the fuel's density, we find that the velocity at the exit is 16.66 meters per second. Notice that the exit hole can be at the end of a hose that first goes up out of the tank, and as long as the exit hose location is at the same Z2 value, the speed would still be the same. 
This concept is elaborated in one of the two minute examples linked in the description below, so make sure to check those out. There, you will find the links to the other lectures of the Fluid Mechanics course, as well as the links to the playlists of other engineering courses, so make sure to check those out as well. Thanks for watching!